Okay, so um, hello, my name is Mason Egger. Um, I'm the lead developer advocate at a small little startup called Gretel.ai. It's a synthetic data company, um, which we're gonna get into a lot about exactly what that is. But uh, if you've heard a lot about the generative AI stuff that's been happening in the news between stable diffusion, chat GPT, you know, taking, taking over all of our jobs and putting us on the street, um, not really. It's very confidently wrong. If you've ever, if you dive deep into it, ChatGPT is very confidently wrong in a lot of things. Um, I wish I had that level of confidence to be that wrong, but it does some really cool stuff. Um, and I'm not going to get into that topic because I definitely have opinions on whether or not uh, it's actually going to take our jobs. Um, it's not. Um, but anyway, we're not going to go too much into that. I, I'm already getting down a sidetrack and we don't want to do that. We're going to talk today about synthetic data. Um, so the, the title of my presentation today is, I can't believe it's not real data, uh, an introduction to synthetic data. I think that's going to qualify as my dad joke, because in and of itself, that's a hilarious joke. I even have stickers uh, with that exact thing. So please come get some when we're done. Um, okay. And then I am just also, I am also the organizer of PyTexas, the conference chair of PyTexas, and I'm the president of the PyTexas Foundation. We will go over that after the talk. Um, but yes, the Texas does have a nonprofit for advancing Python in Texas, and I help run that. So anyway, we'll do that at the end. So imagine, we're going to imagine a couple scenarios where data is kind of a bottleneck. So imagine that you're a developer working on a web application, let's say Django, because that's my favorite framework. We can fight about that in the parking lot later. Um, and you're working on an application that manages students in a classroom, okay? Think Canvas, think what would happen if someone actually put time and effort into building Blackboard properly. Um, so it's time to test. We're building our application, we're doing all these things, and you don't have access to the database for security reasons. Um, for those of you that are not very well versed in the wonderful world of academia, FERPA data, which is the data that is all of your data associated around your student, is protected by law. You're not allowed to just leak that out to anybody. Um, you get big fines for that. So bad, no, no, we can't give developers access to the production database. So we have to let developers either have a test database or we have to rely on developers to write fixtures. And I know that's everybody's favorite thing to do in the world. So we all know you have three fixtures in your Django database, do not lie to me. Um, and an edge case slips through that wasn't represented in the test database and the application fails. Um, maybe it's a small error that caused some rendering. Maybe something bad happens and you, like someone was able to SQL inject you. Who knows, bad things can happen. So that's one instance where not having access to production data or having access to the right data was, you know, not useful for us. So now we're going to go the other spectrum. Let's pretend you're, pretend you're a data scientist, machine learning engineer, and you're trying to build a new model, okay? You want to do something, and you're trying to predict a rare disease. So you want to be able to take patient data, and you want to be able to analyze this data with all of the, you know, the, uh, like, vitals and signs and all that stuff. And you want to be able to predict, hey, whenever the heart rate is blah, and this is blah, I'm not a doctor, um, they're, boom. Touchdown, we have a disease. I don't know. So you start looking for relevant data sets, but you find out you really don't have enough data that you need. Like there's not really a lot of data out there. Um, so you really don't have a lot to deal with. Like you have like this really small data set. So you're like, okay, well, we'll train the model. It's probably not going to work, but this is all we got. So we got to do it. Uh, and the model's unsuccessful because you don't have enough data. You just don't have enough data to train this model well enough. But wait, someone comes in to save you. And there's another hospital around the corner that has similar data. Like they, they've studied the exact same thing, but it's a different hospital. And you think it's going to work, but you can't because all of that data has PII in it, personally identifiable information. And the government also protects this kind of data. And now you don't, you just don't get to share. Your dreams are dashed. You go home and cry at night, have another slice of pizza. Um, at least that's what I would do. So the theme between these two stories is that data is a scarce resource. Um, lack of access to usable testing data is a big problem for pretty much everybody in the tech space. Um, a lot of people are saying like data is going to be the next oil, like, and it really is. Like, why do you think all these big tech companies are collecting as much of it on you as they can? Because it's valuable. Um, and then when you're talking about data scientists, 35% of all time spent in the data science life cycle is spent in this data gathering stage. So like this chart, which is not zoomed in well enough here, talks about like the gathering data. It really is the largest part. All those fun things like writing code is actually the smallest part of the thing because you don't really get, you know, like doing the math, doing the code, not that hard. Going out knocking door to door and getting data takes a long time if that's unfortunately the way you have to get your data. And in some cases it is. Um, data is often inaccessible due to personally identifiable information. You just, you don't get access to it. Try, try going to the DMV and getting everyone in Texas's driver's license. They will laugh you out the door. Um, 
So it's a big problem. And then there's problems around limited data sets. So maybe you have data, but you just don't have enough of it. It's like, oh, if I only had 10,000 more records in my database, I'd be able to actually do something with this, but I don't. Um, and it can be prohibitively expensive or sometimes even impossible to collect the data. Prohibitively expensive, imagine if you had to go knock to door, knock, knocking door to door and do stuff. Impossible, imagine you're trying to track something in, a celesti in the celestial skies where that comet just passed for the first time in 10,000 years and it'll be back in 3067. Who thinks they'll still be around to collect the data in 3067? You probably won't. And if you are, please let us know your secrets. <laughs> and also a big problem in data is that there's biased data. So say we have enough data, say we have access to it, but then the data is biased. And we really don't know, like there's some just bad representations in there. And data can be skewed in a lot of different representations. So not only is data a scarce resource, but it's hard to get a hold of because there's a lot of problems that could potentially happen with it. And this is where synthetic data comes in. Synthetic data is a bleeding edge technology, okay? Until I took this job, I didn't know what it was. And that was eight months ago, so... We're in the same page. Um, but so, so synthetic data is basically this, which is a really, this is a fun uh, quote from my, um, from my CPO. Also, I don't have my slide notes. So I see things coming on the slide as you do, but I don't lose track of where I'm at. So I've given this talk like 20 times. So I know where it's going. I hope, unless someone changed it. <laughs> um, these are the jokes, just so you know. Um, so synthetic data is artificially annotated information that is generated by computer algorithms or simulations commonly used as an alternative to real world data. In more non-technical speak, synthetic data is created by training generative machine learning models on your data. So right now, all these fancy model, these things that are happening in the news, these generative AI, all they're doing is they've been trained on, you know, the wealth of the internet, the knowledge that is the human internet, and they're able to spit stuff out because they can generate kind of around there. That's basically the same thing synthetic data does. You train a machine learning model to learn what your data looks like, and then that generative model creates data that is look like, looks like your model. So... You may be asking, well, isn't that just fake data? And the answer to that is no, it's actually different. Um, synthetic data is different from what we would call fake or mock data. When you think, you may be thinking of like the library Faker, it's a very popular Python library people use to do things with. Um, fake or mock data is not representative at all. It's purely random. You're saying you want names, addresses, and birthdays, and it's just, it's just generating, generating it out depending on the, the entropy that your computer is currently spitting out. Um, Fake or mock data can often be too clean. This is actually a really interesting thing is that data can come in and it's not clean. Everyone who's ever had to work with data processing knows that data cleaning is one of the largest and most difficult things to do. So your fake or mock data isn't, te isn't testing your application or your model because nowhere in the world does the data look that nice. Um, so synthetic data is generated from the existing data. So what we do is we take our data and we train a model and we generate more of it. It will look and behave exactly like the initial data set. Um, and then synthetic data can be nearly as representative as the initial data set. Like it is, it's, almost, it's a, basically a drop in replacement for your other data. Let's go a little bit more into that. So how accurate is synthetic data? Well, people are probably thinking that I'm selling them snake oil. I'm not, we have math. Um, unlike fake data, synthetic data can be nearly as accurate as the real data. And in the link of this, we've actually seen that we can improve accuracy in machine learning models with synthetic data over traditionally gathered data. So that is dark magic. I don't know how it works. These slides are on my website. You may read that article, but it's way over my head how it worked out that way. Um, our, mach our machine learning, like our applied researchers can, can explain it. Mason cannot. Downstream data consumers can readily make use of synthetic data. So instead of having to do all of this cleaning and stuff, you can just generate some synthetic data and your downstream tasks can already access it. Um, so for example, a classifier, we, uh, we had a classifier that we trained on synthetic data that was basically like, did you order a pizza or did you not order a pizza? Um, so it can get the same accuracy as the classifier trained in the original data set. So if we look at this, did user buy pizza or not? If you're looking at the accuracy between the two, between the lo uh, logistic regression, between on the synthetic and the real data, they're almost identical. When you look at the recall, they're almost identical and precision is almost identical. They're almost the exact same. I bump my Siri watch and the crown always activates Siri. So we take off that when we do that. So also if there are chat things, I'm gonna check real quick, but I'm bad. I'm gonna, I will handle, I will handle questions at the end because I can't watch chat and talk at the same time. I'm not that talented. So what can you use synthetic data for? Well, the answer is pretty much anything. So synthetic data can act as an alternative to real world data. So anywhere where you need real world data, you can use synthetic data. 
Um, any task where you need data, that seems like I made a typo. Why are there two of those there? <laughs> oh yeah, any, sorry, it, I got ahead of myself. Any task where you need data, you can use synthetic data and it acts as an alternative. So are you training models? Synthetic data is great. Are you testing applications and need access to a production database? Create a synthetic database based off your, for off your production database. And now you have data that looks exactly like your production database, but there's no PII in it. There's no risk of leaking anything. If anybody gets it, as long as the correlations between your data are not the secret sauce, doesn't matter if this data gets leaked. Um, creating sample data for demos. We see a lot of people doing this who are trying to like demo solutions architects need to be able to demo large scale applications at these large cloud providers. And they create sample data that creates these giant applications so they can test all of them and demo what it looks like in real time. Anonymizing data. You can anonymize data with synthetic data. Kind of, there's a couple, you have to add a couple of our tools to it, um, but for the most part, it anonymizes data and more. There's just a lot you can do with it. So how do you use synthetic data? Well, there's a lot of really cool use cases. I'm gonna cover three today. So one of the use cases is you can make private data accessible and safely shareable. So that problem we had at the beginning where we couldn't share data between hospitals, we've solved that problem now with this. We can generate more samples with limited data sets. So say we, again, the same problem is we didn't have enough data, we can generate more data with it. And the third thing is, and this is the really fun one to dive into, is we can actually reduce bias in machine learning data sets with synthetic data. And I, caveat asterisk, if you are able to identify the bias in the initial data set. Otherwise, you need to be able to notice that this data set was in fact biased, and then we can fix it. So first one, how do we make data pri make private data accessible and shareable with synthetic data? Um, data very often contains personally identifiable information or PII, making it very risky or in some parts of the world illegal to even for developers to even work with. There's these four letters that everybody fears. It's called GDPR. And it's a really quick, not following those rules is a very quick way to bankrupt a company and go to prison, especially in the EU. So don't do it. Like they can find, like the fines on it are ridiculous. Like they can take, I think up to 10% of your net revenue for, for a violation. So Google could be, if Google violated GDPR in theory, they could potentially, and if they had a, you know, they could potentially be forced to pay a couple trillion dollars in, in fines. The, GD, the EU is taking data privacy very seriously. So, and here's the secret that nobody ever wants to say out loud. Developers and data scientists don't want access to the PII. If I get a data set with somebody's credit cards in it, I'm scared shitless because I do not want that. I don't want that responsibility. Like I don't, this laptop goes home with me. If someone steals this laptop, that data could be out there. I don't want that. All I care about is the correlations between the data. I care about what the data is saying. I don't care if Mason's credit card number is in there or if uh, Florence's credit card number is in there. I care that there's credit card numbers in there. So we don't want that. So generating synthetic data allows you to have statistically similar data while removing the PII. This allows you to share your data, not only within the company, but externally as well. So a couple of cases where this would be valuable is, okay, we go back to that application, we're building the student database. Let's generate a synthetic database. Okay, now we have 100,000 records of students that you know range and we can do synthetic time series data, synthetic tabular data. So this is like everything that the university has, all the data for the students, but now it's synthetic. So you can completely test on this database, you can do load and performance testing, and none of the actual valuable information is in that data set. If that data set were to be exposed, there's nothing there. Like it's, it's yeah, it's a bunch of random data, but they don't have my name. They have whatever the, whatever the AI decided to name me today. Let AI name yourself, it'll go really well. Another really cool example is, and this is one we actually have an example of at Gretel, is you can have your data in an S3 bucket in AWS, and instead of giving people access to that S3 bucket, you can have a function in the middle that every time they request it, it automatically generates synthetic data on the, bring down, on the way down. So the people who are accessing it never directly have access to the, to the production data, to the protected data, and now you can get it. And now we can share this data. We can give it to other hospitals. We can share things that we've never been able to share for, before because of data privacy laws in ways that we've never been able to do. Like we're literally on the, we're on the, like the bleeding edge of this. In the next like two to three years, we're gonna see data sharing reach levels we've never seen before. So that's the current first one. That's one of my favorites I like talking about. Augmenting small data sets. Okay. So not having a not enough of the right data is definitely a serious bottleneck. Like you either just, you either have to train a model and, and pray for like 60% 60, 60 accuracy on the small amount of data or hope that it gets anything near where it needs to be, or you just kind of give up. Um, so data is often the most valuable asset and collecting data is expensive and hard. Again, if we're doing celestial objects, you may never get to see that again. If you're dealing with patient records on an extremely rare disease, 
I hope everybody gets like no, I hope don't hope everybody gets an extremely rare disease. But it's like, oh, the, we would really like be great if like three thousand more people walked through the front door with this disease that three people have had in the history of mankind would be really great. Not really, that's sarcasm. Um, but like in this context, it makes sense. Out of context quotes, these are going to be fun. I'm looking forward to this. Uh, synthetic data allows you to generate unlimited amounts of data based on the relative on a relatively small data set. So you train your generative model on this data set. It learns what your data looks like. And then it's just generative AI. It just spits out as much as you want. Like I, we, we've, we've tested it with generating billions upon billions of records, petabytes of records of data off of a single data set that we, tra we train the model on. And we, um, there's also like synthetic data quality scores. That's more towards Gretel, not towards the synthetic data, but I'll go through Gretel stuff in a minute. Um, so now you have a machine learning model with a small amount of data. You train this, uh, you can use synthetic data to regularize your model training. And then from a testing standpoint, you can load and stress test your application. Oh, time to take out the track. Everyone's eight o'clock alarm went out, went off. I knew that was going to happen too. I told myself on the way here, turn that off. It's going to go off in the middle of your presentation. It did. So pass me, someone smarter than future Mason. Uh, so from a testing standpoint, load, load and stress testing your application. So like very often, if you're doing stuff in like DevOps or something, you may be used to applications called like Chaos Monkey or something, things that intentionally try to like crash your website. But again, that's all random data. It's not representative of the actual traffic. So if you can collect all of the data traffic that you have that comes to your site, train a synthetic model on it. Now you can generate as much traffic that looks like actual user traffic. Chaos testing is a weird, uh, weird rabbit hole we're not gonna dive down to, but it's cool. And then finally, reducing bias in data sets. This is a really cool thing you can do with synthetic data. So bias data is a big problem. I think I don't think I have to convince anybody of that. Um, it leads to inaccurate models and unfair results and may even cause harm. You know, like on the best case of on the best of days, your model just sucks. In the worst case scenario, it's physically harming people. And that is a possibility where like these things that we train now, the amount of AI that we rely on now, we have to be cognizant of what we're doing with it. So we have to be not cognizant of bias and remove it. So if you can identify the bias in your data set, you can use synthetic data to balance your data set. And I've got a really cool example of this. This is another great blog post we've done. So we, uh, Gretel took the Kaggle data set that is on the heart disease, heart disease, uh, heart disease prediction classifier, I believe. Um, six, in the data set, 68% of the data was labeled as male and 32% of the data was labeled as female with a two to one ratio of male data to female data. So obviously in this data set, um, the female is the minority data set in the heart disease model. Um, what they were able to do is, okay, we need more female patient data to balance this data set. They were able to use synthetic data and seed the model to tell it, hey, generate more female data sets. We need more data sets that, that, that are female data sets so we can balance it where we can get a one to one ratio, a 50-50% ratio. The accuracy increased of the model increased from 88.5% to 96.7% accuracy. And what it ended up leading to is 6.17% more females with heart disease were now accurately diagnosed. Now, if you're good at math, which I'm not, you'll see that those numbers don't quite add up. Um, and the reason is, is because inaccuracies in the majority class or, or imbalance in data affects all classes, not just the minority class in the data set. So by, in, by balancing the data set to, and making it where it was a equal distribution between male and female heart, heart patient data, not only did the female prediction model go up, but the male prediction model went up as well because the model wasn't guessing. Like when you get to this point, the model is basically just guessing. Like it kind of knows what it's doing, but it hasn't actually learned. So we were able to balance it out and inc dramatically increase the data. So if you can recognize bias in your data sets you can and you can balance them out, you're going to get better results from your model. So where is synthetic data being used? Like this sounds like great. Like how maybe you may be wondering how I've never heard of this before. And again, like eight months ago, Mason never had either. Um, but where is it being used? Like, is this brand new or are people actually using it? It's being used in a lot of places. People just aren't talking about it as much. It's gaining a lot of steam right now. Um, like I'm on the I'm on the little boogie board and we're going up the wave right now. Um, automotive and robotics, self-driving cars. This is used a lot in self-driving cars for creating, like we don't have enough data of how people drive in the road. We don't have enough data of what a stop sign looks like, creating all of that. 
Uh, financial services, creating synthetic time series data to enable sharing, sharing of data that doesn't compromise customer privacy. Cybersecurity and InfoSec are using it to detect rare events, including fraud and cyber attacks. Healthcare and life sciences, this is a really cool one. And this is what Gretel's working on right now. They are creating syno synthetic genomic data to fuel medical breakthroughs and encourage better uh, medical care. So they're act we're actively working right now with Illumina to synthesize a human genome. And then imagine, just imagine the things we could do if we could, if we could create as, if we didn't have to, has anyone here ever actually tried to get a genome? Have you ever like tried, like call up, like, hey, I need a genome today. Um, the paperwork is about as tall as this building and it takes anywhere from six months to three and a half years. Imagine if we could just share genomes, like all the things we could solve, protein folding, all of it. I'm not a health and life sciences person, but this thing really affects everything. Manufacturing, this is the one I oddly get a lot of people asking me about. Um, they're using it to simulate uh, uh, IoT data and sensors so they can simulate supply chain failures. Because if you have a sensor on a manufacturing floor, that sensor probably only goes out once every four or five years. But you don't have enough data to know to read the data coming in to know, hey, the sensor is about to go bad. So they take that very small amount of data that they have when the sensor is about to die and they augment it. And now they can train models that are able to predict when the sensors in the, in the factory are dead or when they're about to go out and more. There's so much. This is like from a blog, and this is like half of the things. These are the things that I thought were really cool I wanted to talk about. Okay, so I've told you that this is the best thing since sliced bread, and you're probably thinking, well, it has to taste terrible, right? Like it's, it's no, it's, it's, there are challenges. All new tech has challenges. Honestly, the generative AI space has been moving so fast lately, these might not even be accurate anymore. The chat GPT thing really like a lot has changed in the generative AI space in like the last two weeks. Things people did not think were possible are now not only possible, but they're successful and it's crazy. Um, highly dimensional data sets with hundreds of thousands of columns can be very compute intensive. At the end of the day, you're still training a machine learning model. This is very compute intensive. Now you can do smaller models relatively quickly, not that hard. But if you've got like a huge data set with like the hundreds or thousands of columns, it's gonna be a lot. Uh, synthesizing relational data sets can require some manual configuration. This is mostly around making maintaining um, relationships between the databases. So like being able to, like basically the way that you synthesize a relational database is you dump all of the tables and then you create a mapping of tables to relationships. So you have like, so say you have three tables and like each one has a primary key to the other. You dump the three tables. So you synthesize on those and then you then you create a table. It's like this map to this, this map to this, this map to this, and you feed it into the model. And then through what Gretel's doing, you're able to, um, you're able to like kind of like you can preserve relationships in synthetic data, which I think is really cool. Um, some privacy preserving technologies, such as differential privacy, require very large amounts of data to provide strong privacy guarantees without degrading accuracy. So the synthetic data um, adds a layer of privacy you still have to do a couple of other things. So like, I like the, and again, this is in the context of Gretel, there's like three products that Gretel has. Mm -hmm. Synthetic data, uh, classification of PII, so basically a natural language, pro natural language processing um, thing that goes through and says, hey, you've got PII here, and then transform, which basically transforms the data. If you want the most since, uh, privacy out of your data, you would transform the data set first, removing or, or fudging the synthetic data and then you would train the model on it then there's no chance of like i don't know the names of these attacks i used to think i knew cybersecurity, and then i learned about data attacks and they're a lot different um but like re-identification attacks and stuff like that because that can be a problem um synthetic data generation takes time and effort like this is it's it it takes time like even so like gretel has like two different types of models there's basically generative GANs, general adversarial networks, and then there's like statistical models. The statistical models can generate billions of re records of data in record time, but they have an accuracy of about 67%, which is still not bad. The generative models um, take a little bit longer, but like you can get accuracy up in like the 90%. Like this is 90% like your other data set. Okay, what does the future hold for synthetic data? So by 2030, Gartner predicts that synthetic data will overshadow real data and AI models. Um, a lot of people are saying there's just not enough data in the world to do the level of model training that we need to do. So synthetic data is going to fill that gap. Um, it's already happening today. There are, it also allows for easier compliance under data protection laws, such as GDPR and CCPA. This is something that since the last time I've given this talk, there's actually been a lot of progress on. They are a lot of the, uh, politicians and lawyers and stuff in the EU are starting to say that synthetic data is like, you won't have a GDPR violation. If, you're, if you synthesize your database 
and they're like willing to do a whole bunch of stuff about to like back that up. So it's going to be, it's eventually going to become a compliance tool, which is ugh, yucky compliance. But anyway, it uh, reduces attack vector on, um, on data. So you don't re-identification, all that. If you have less people that have access to the production database, the database, can't, like their credentials can't be leaked because let's be honest, 90, sometimes you leave an S3 bucket open to the public. Oops, please don't do that. Um, the, the, the whole narrative on television of a hacker sitting at his computer, banging away at a keyboard, trying to brute force stuff is such horse shit. Nobody actually does that. The easiest way to get access to your data is to social engineer you and to convince you to give me your password. Like, and most of you probably don't have very strong, pa I, I'm not gonna, I'm not, you can, if your password, you don't raise your hand. <laughs> you don't, we don't know who's in the room. But make a note, if your password is uppercase letter, a whole bunch of things, number, and then an, an, a, a uh, special character, probably an exclamation mark, you do not have a strong password, okay? Um, it's much easier to social engineer people than it is to ever get data. So if you have less people that have keys to prod that actually can touch the database, it's safer. So by just, if you use this, even as a software developer, this is a really kind of like a machine learning tool, data science tool, but even as a software engineering company, if you were able to say, hey, we're gonna take all of our prod databases, we're gonna synthesize all of them. Every developer in the company now has access to a prod-like database, but only, only the SRE team, only the, the four people on the SRE team have actually have access to prod keys and everybody else used to have access to it, you've reduced your attack vector by a lot and it's a lot safer. And then eventually, Synthetic data is going to solve what's known as the cold start problem. I know that my colleagues are working on this. This is basically give me a, here's a schema, give me data, but give me data that's actually real, that like the addresses aren't bullshit. Like we actually, I actually saw a demo of this the other day where it's like, I want data from like the Midwest and it gave what would have been accurate addresses. Now the street addresses may not have been the same, but like the street, the numbers on the number, like it was like number and then street address and then zip code and then city, they all lined up. It was feasible that that data was, was could happen. That would never happen in something like Faker where you would just get random number, random street, random thing. It was actually feasible. You could actually plot these fictitious locations, um, which is an interesting problem in and of itself. Uh, so you have no data to start with. So how do you get started using synthetic data? Uh, there's a lot of resources available. This is a very new field. Um, so there's only like a handful of companies doing it, but there's a lot of really cool open source uh, things. So open source agenda, there's like a, there's a list for the tags. There's an awesome synthetic data list. There's an awesome list for everything. Um, there are open source options available. Um, the company that I work for, Gretel, all of our models are open source. So you can go and train the model. Um, that takes a lot of GPUs. Have fun with that. Synthetic Data Vault is another really big one that has a lot of synthetic data models and stuff. Um, they have a really big community in Slack that you can do. Um, stable diffusion we're seeing now with images. There's a lot of options, but I'm going to talk about the Gretel stuff because that's where I work for. Um, Gretel Synthetics is open source. There are multiple models. This needs to be updated. Um, LSTM is the original model, um, long short-term memory. Basically, that's our tabular data model. We have uh, the, the uh, scientist who works there. She's absolutely brilliant, and she has solved tabular data, and it's amazing, and it works really well. Um, GPT, we have our own implementation of GPT-3. I think it's GPT-3neo, um, CTGAN, and then like what we call ACTGAN. We have a new one called DGAN or Doppelganger. It's an implementation of the Doppelganger. Uh, model, if you know the paper. Anyway, it's synthetic time series data. So if you need time series data, you can do time series data now. It's really cool. Um, you can train these models yourself. Um, if you're doing it on AWS, you're going to rack up a hefty bill. Um, if you're doing it at home, you don't need a space heater this winter. Um, you will need a GPU. You can't do this without it. Uh, and you can access it here at our repository, but there's easier ways to do these things. Um, you could just try Gretel Cloud. Okay. It's a product that I rep they're not that I kind of talk about. So you don't want a GPU, you want to create synthetic data before you leave this room tonight. It only takes about five to seven minutes for the model to train. Writing the code is actually super simple. So we have a free tier. Everyone has a free tier. You're more than welcome to train. I think you're up, you're limited to like a half, a quarter of a million synthetic records a month. So you can synthesize those. You can do more transforms in CI, uh, PII. Um, this is our experimental library, Gretel Trainer. It's eventually going to be folded into our, we have a large Python SDK. And then we have this like really neat like how cool can we make things like this is our this is our, our sandbox so this set of this these five lines of code three lines of actual code two lines regarding like imports and setting the data set is all you would need to train as train a model and generate synthetic data so you would basically import the trainer the data set you would want to provide it as a url 
It's the easiest way. Now you you can try to pass it in as like you could like open up G Drive or do it or maybe do an open file. I haven't necessarily tried that. I usually just send the URL, upload it to S3 or put it on something, um, and then print the model and then generate and you'll get synthetic data. A couple of additional resources you can check out our docs. Um, Gretel Blueprints is a large scale. Um, it's like this large repository of like all the like all the production uses we can possibly think of. We write a blue, we write a Jupyter notebook for it, and we throw it into a repository. So if you want to like, if you want to train data on, um, if you, I can't think of an example right now. Like yeah, so say you want to do uh, multi relational databases. Got a thing for that. You want to do time series right now? We've got notebooks for that. We've got notebooks for everything. You get a notebook. Actually, I need that meme here. You get a notebook, you get a notebook, everybody gets a notebook. And then there's fun with synthetic data. This is the little repository that I kind of play around in. I have one that generates synthetic cocktails. I have one that writes Taylor Swift lyrics. Yeah. Okay, so that's what I have for this time. Um, I'm about, I'm gonna finish this slide, then I'm going to go to the chat answer. No, I'm not, because I will never make it back because I'll answer questions over. I'm gonna finish this slide. We're gonna talk about PyTexas and then I will come back and answer chat for those of you that are in the chat. So you can follow me on Twitter um, at Mason Egger. You can follow Gretel. You can join our Discord. Gretel has a Discord server that if you wanna come in and you're like, if you're working with stuff, you wanna to talk to some of our solutions engineers for your specific case. You want to talk with sales because you wanna do anything. You wanna to talk to me because you think I'm funny. Uh -huh. Aha. <laughs> um, just come and hang out with us in Discord. Uh, you can just get started at Gretel.ai and all of these slides, uh, if you look for a similar topic, title it's on my website at mason.dev um okay so i'm going to go to pytexas and then we're going to talk about that scene change it no worky okay because ah, i shared a thing not a i shared the window not the screen so now let's go here scene change pytexas okay pytexas is in austin this year Woo how many of you knew there was a conference great fantastic thank you fly um yes so there is an annual we've had an annual conference for the last like 15 years it's been in austin for a while now um mostly because the venue that we go to is relatively cheap so it's at the austin public library we're looking to move next year but if any if you like venue space is difficult and we don't really like have a lot of money in the foundations thing so a couple things to note it's april 1st and 2nd 2023 it's a two-day conference single track um we've lined up our keynotes i can't um, really talk about them yet because they haven't accepted, but I'm super excited for the people we're bringing in for keynoting. Um, early bird tickets are available through the beginning of the year, or th yeah, through the beginning of next year. Oh, the Zoom thing is in the way. Go away, Zoom. Um, right now, there's $65. Corporate early bird is $295. If your company is paying for you to go, please pay the corporate price. <laughs> Screw, stick it to the man. From on my thing, um, we 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 intentionally operate Pi Texas at a at a loss for individuals because we're trying our best. Um, but so the corporate like for every, every corporate ticket you buy, it subsidizes like two tickets unless you go to the normal rate, which then it goes up to like four ninety five, and then the non early bird price will be eighty five. So if you want to save twenty bucks, come to Pi Texas, you can. Um, also, our CFP is open, so um, we're looking for anything and everything. You want to give a talk? And come, please submit CFPs. This will close on January 15th. So you have about a month starting tomorrow. If you have any questions or anything, feel free to ask like if you need help or you want like any sort of like speaker mentorship, I will happily mentor you. As you can tell, I speak for a living. Um, there are a lot of people in our community that will happily mentor you. Um, so please submit CFPs. We would love to see you there. Buy tickets. Um, you may be wondering how to like get in contact with us. As always, there's a Discord server. I need to make this a little bit better. So this is something that we've built within the last like, couple of months that we're trying to grow. And this is something for you as well, is that we're trying to build a Pi Texas community Discord server, not just the conference, but like the state. So there's different channels for like Austin. Dallas has already kind of moved in. San Antonio, I never can get a hold of them. Um, but the, so the Pi, the Pi Texas conference is run by a 501c3 nonprofit called the Pi Texas Foundation. So for a while, you know, pandemic and then, organizers having kids and stuff. It's been mostly just the conference. We are really trying to expand the foundation. So if anyone wants to help or wants to volunteer, please reach out to me. Um, there's stuff within the conference that we need help for. There's stuff within the foundation that we need help for. We definitely want to start doing more like outreach in schools, um, you know, more being able to sponsor some of these meetups, um, being able to send, pe send people to PyCon to go to the big party, you know, the big party in this year, it's in Salt Lake City. If you don't know what PyCon is, you should Google it. It's fantastic. It's the best place. You can walk around with Guido Van Rossum. He's like 6'5", and he looks down at you. Um, 
So he's the creator of Python, if you don't know that. So um, yeah, so we're doing a lot with that. Um, if your company wants to sponsor, we have, and you're hiring, we have a, a large sponsorship prospectus. You can find it on the website. Um, we are really trying to get local companies to sponsor. We believe that they'll get the most benefit out of the conference than say, bringing Microsoft down from Redmond to come down here. Um, not that I would not accept Microsoft's money. I would accept it with bells and whistles. Um, but if you're local, you're trying to hire someone, you want to talk about your company and stuff, this is a great place to network. Um, I think the max capacity of our current venue is about 250. So that's the size you could expect if you're looking to sponsor. Um, yeah. That is the PyTexas stuff. Are there any questions on the PyTexas stuff before I go back to the synthetic data stuff? Because this is the fun stuff. Synthetic data is my day job. This is what I do on the side for funsies. Also, you can get a wonderful shirt with our neon logo. So we're so creative. Okay, so let's go back to the chat for the actual questions. Um, does that say 70 something? Oh, it says seven, thank God. Uh, cool. Hey. Da, 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 da. Okay, does anyone have any questions? Yeah, what's up? Yeah, great. I feel like there's like out of bounds like data, mm -hmm. you know, random data with high functionality for a lot of data that wouldn't really be ideal. So, the stuff like so really rare events are actually really good. They're actually nice because you can tune how much, how often those things are, appear. So what a lot of people will do is like really rare events goes back to the time series example that I gave for factories is that they have, say say Ford has a factory that bolts doors on the truck and there's a sensor on that robotic arm that does it. That sensor dies once every decade, like, and they have to replace it. That's a really rare event. How do you train for it? Yes, but they have no, but they've seen it. They may have seen it before, but they have like this much data on it. So if they're trying to train a model on like, when is this thing going to, going to, uh, trip, or if they're just trying to write their software, they either have to go dig up that that data, or they need to like, you know, maybe they only have two of them, like what, like, and you don't really know. So you can synthesize that. And then for seasonal data, that's where your, your time series stuff would happen. So we actually have our time series data thing has um, basically does things on a sliding window of like how much time you have. And we've been able to accurately use it to predict like um, internet traffic. So internet traffic, uh, stock, well, not predict, to synthesize internet traffic, um, stock prices. And if you know anything about like daily internet traffic to a website, it usually like up, 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 and then everyone goes home for the weekend and then up, 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 up. So the, the, I would imagine that seasonal traffic would just be that on a, on a yearly, on a yearly scale. Not and, data for that. Yes. Anything and, that you don't have data for. Yes. If you do not have, yeah. You couldn't synthesize. No. If you do not have data for it, you cannot synthesize it. And another one, and I don't know why it didn't come up this time. I, it's usually in these slides. Maybe I removed it. Is people always ask me, what if my data is trash? Am I going to synthesize trash? Like, yes, you will synthesize trash. Like this is a this is a thing that gives you data that looks like your data. The onus is still on you to make sure your data is representative of what you're trying to solve and is still valid data. If you get, I, there is no, when we get to the point where you can give me crap and I give you gold, that's called alchemy. And they've been trying to solve that since the 12th century. Doesn't happen. Doesn't happen in metals, doesn't happen in data. So yes, you're, you're right. If you don't have things, then you're not gonna be able to synthesize them. But if you have just enough, you can create as much of it as you want. Now, say you have three records, it's probably gonna look like one of those three records. So it's, it is there. Um, what we've seen with like, where we saw it really was like with the heart disease model where the female heart patient data wasn't, it's not rare, it's just not enough. There was 68% male, 32% female. That's not a rare event, but it just wasn't enough of it. So we were able to do that. Um, but I mean, yeah, it's still better than like, you know, guessing. At the end of the day, it beats guessing. Um, we have a question from Jacob. Did you consider evolutionary computation to enhance statistical data? This is useful to balance your data to reach statistical goals. I did this for population data. That is a question for the people that implemented that, Jacob. I have no clue. If you want to look at it, it's called Gretel Amplify, A-M-P-L-I-F-Y. There's a blog post about it on our website. Um, and you're more than welcome to look at it. I, they may have done that. Our, our, our applied researchers are really, really bright, but I would not know the answer to that question. I don't do anything around, um, I don't do anything around the actual like work around training these models and like the applied research. They have people with PhDs that do that. And I don't have a high enough, um, I don't have a high enough level degree or want to. Like this stuff is cool to look at, but like I had no desire to train machine learning models. Um, I think it's cool. I, I see all the things that this stuff can do from the ops side of things. Um, when I look at like the transforms and stuff, all of the, um, all of the time, like, so I was working in cybersecurity when GDPR was being like released 
And you know, we 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 sold cybersecurity products that logged everything. And now we everyone was concerned. Like, is an IP IP address considered personally identifiable information? So like. Now we need to transform all of this data because I have, if I have to ship this data off the box, I could potentially be liable if this data were to leak. So now we've know a little bit more about it then now, but at the time it was really kind of terrifying um, because so those GDPR fines are no joke. Like they'll take all your money and they'll they'll feel they'll they'll you know laugh at you while they do it. So you know I see it from like the DevOps side of being able to generate an unlimited amount of traffic that looks like my regular traffic, or be, or from the application developer side where now I can give every developer in my org access to a database that acts and looks like prod, but is not actually prod. That is one of the big values to me. And then all of the machine learning stuff is like where the actual value is. It's like, yeah, we need to be able to train a model to do that. So uh, I don't see any other questions in the chat. So a practical, uh, how it's done, if you're going to a hospital and you can't really ship it there. You just go, hey, we're gonna we're gonna put this on your network, and you'll just have to trust us that we're not stealing stuff. So it's one. There's one. That's one way that. And then, mm -hmm. then pull the whistle. Yep. Yes. Yes. And we have. Yeah. We. So there's two options of doing. It. There's the cloud, where you could upload your data to us. Most people don't like that, <laughs> and I've I have spent a long time explaining that to people. Um, or you can run it on prem. So there is an on prem model where your data never leaves your data center. Um, you're running these big, large GPU machines, and yes, you could do it that way. Yeah, you do it some. You do at some point have to, you know, trust us to not be sending your data off. But I mean, if you were really concerned about it, you wire shark in between me and that box and make sure I'm not dumping a terabyte of data. On. Like it'd be really obvious if I started uploading, you know, your prod database off your network. You like, you, hopefully, your IT security would catch that. If they don't, you might want to reevaluate your IT security strategy. Um, we have a question in the. Chat, what is a prod-like database? Okay, so a prod-like database, and this is a term that I might've just made up on the spot. It's a database that resembles production data, but doesn't contain PII. So like the, the, the main thing is like the relationships between the data within the database. So how do how are people actually like activate? Like if you do using Faker, okay, how do you, and Faker's just randomly generating, say a, a web form. Let's do something simple like a web form. The web form can't tell you that like, or, or sorry, Faker data would be hard pressed to tell you 38% of people select option A when they go through, but the prod light database can, or the prod database could. They also couldn't tell you a lot of other things like how are they inputting their name? Are they, or someone trying to SQL inject me? Um, what, how, what is the format of like what's coming in through the text, like through the, through the open text field? What we can do with a prod light database is we can, but we can't give the developers the prod stuff because they may have their information, their social security number in it, or who knows what data is in there. Even their name, we don't want that, or their email. You know, so what do we do? Well, we synthesize it. We synthesize the database, and now you have a database that has the same characteristics of the data that came in, but it has no production. It has no personally identifiable information. PII is the personally identifiable. Another question in the chat. Personally identifiable information. Yes. I was making sure my acronym was correct. I was like, is identifiable still? I had that one of those moments where English did not make sense in my brain. Um, so yes, PII, personally identifiable information, they're interchangeable. It's a lot, so try saying that like five times fast. It's, it's old. Yes. So um, you can't generate something you haven't seen before, right? You have to. Yes, you cannot generate, we can't, yeah, you cannot generate something you haven't seen before yet. We are working on the cold start problem, which is you give us a schema and we generate something like what you think you want, but we don't have the ability to generate something you haven't seen before. But for instance, when you you're doing like human face to do you seen blue and black you couldn't have it nowhere generate something with red eyes or something um it's a great question i don't know a lot about image synthetics but i have seen those i have seen those like stable diffusion things mess up in ways that i've never understood so maybe i don't think you could i, do, I don't believe you would be able to if you were only training that model on your data set i would say correct you would not be able to generate something like that that's my assumption, because when you look at something like Stable Diffusion or like the uh, all these apps that are on the internet now, they're trained on large data sets, very, very large data sets. Like GPT-3 is trained on like all of Wikipedia. So they've seen damn near everything. But if you're training it on your data set, you know, you have 10,000 columns of customer data because they're ordering your dishwashers. That's all you have. You can't really learn what's not there. So I would assume that it's the, that you can't generate based on that. But 
I've been, it's been weird before. <laughs> the, there's still a lot of like art to, or there's still a little bit of art in training models. Sometimes they just do kooky things. But I do love machine learning because you can punish models. I think that's like the best thing ever is like, there's like a way to punish them. And I've always wanted to be able to punish my computer for misbehaving. So maybe I will become a machine learning person. How do you punish? I have no idea, but I've heard about it. I've heard that they I heard that like whenever you're training it, there's like some like variables you can set and like punishes it for getting it wrong. I'm like, that sounds fun. I want to do that. I want to punish the thing and teach it not to mess up. Exactly. Yeah, because we're punishing them. I for one welcome our, our robot overlords. What's up? Do you have much experience supervising like financial data time series wise? I personally do not. Gretel does Gretel does. Yes. Yes, we work with a couple of banks. So if you're interested in it, um, so join the, if you're interested in it, gretel.ai Gretel slash discord is you can't, not sharing the right screen. screen. Let's go back to sharing this screen. Um, so you can join the discord and just jump in and ask, or you can just email me and I will have like mason at gretel.ai or just go to gretel.ai and like just like, but we will happily put you in contact with anyone. Um, how much are we done like i'm i'm done but i'm happy to do a demo if people want to see a demo but i don't have to do a demo i'd rather i don't know i give you think of people a break yeah um yeah does anyone have any uh, any other questions yeah so from the uh like the anonymization mm -hmm. data and the PII, yeah i could imagine maybe not into this in the older teams but i could imagine some kind of uh machine learning models that are used to generate the data mm -hmm. would have something that would kind of try to reverse engineer that and cross-reference it against existing data to use that. Yeah, so that's why you have, that's why you, if you're going to do anonymization, so Gretel has, so Gretel approached synthetic data from a privacy per, first perspective. When I first joined the company, the company was supposed to be the, the, the developer toolkit for data privacy. They saw that generative AI was going to be the thing that was going to make us money, so we went to that. So synthetic data by itself, yes. If you just train a synthetic data model, you you and on just a raw data set, you can get what's known as a reflect. Like I think it's like a, a re-identification attack where you could do that. That's why you have to do a transform. So a transform would basically, in the in Gretel terms, a transform would go through and then like basically kind of like use natural language processing to detect when PII is present and then change it. So it would change it to like you know from Mason at Masonegger.com to Steve at Steve.com. And then now that you have that transform data, then you could still re-identify from that. Then you feed that into the model because now you're two layers of separation away from it. And if you're still really concerned about it, there's extra knobs you can tune in Gretel to turn privacy up. We can start using stuff called differential privacy, which is basically, you can think of it almost like a salt. Like it's, like it's fuzzing, you're fuzzing the data. You're adding just a little bit of noise to make it where the, the attack vector back in is virtually impossible. Um, I will not speak for quantum computing, but as in modern times, it would be that way. So yes. Um, and then the cool thing about Gretel is not only is it code based, but it's also got a console and a UI base. So you can drag and drop a CSV file into Gretel and generate synthetic data. You no code, it has a no code required option. Um, you're more than welcome to try that. I can kind of pull that up real quick. If I can even log into it, to be honest, because I um, this is my work laptop, but I usually work on my desktop and I don't play with this one that much, so. And then there's, and then also one other, one other thing that I didn't go over in this talk, because this talk is not meant to be like a Gretel sales pitch, but you're kind of getting the ass end of it because I'm here. Um, this is usually a conference talk that I have like 25 minutes to talk in. Um, Gretel has data accuracy scoring. So you may be wondering how accurate, accurate is the data? We have entire blog posts. We, we create a synthetic data quality report that uses three different, um, mechanisms that I cannot name right now, but I will pull one up if I have one available. If not, I'll pull up the blog. And says like the, you know, how much did it drift? How much is this? And we can tell you with, with pretty reasonable confidence that this data is 92% accurate compared to your other thing, which again, you don't want 100% accuracy. That's one of, if you have 100% accuracy, you just spit out the same thing and then it's not actually synthetic data. Like you wouldn't want it to be exactly the same because if it's exactly the same, you didn't synthesize. And then you may be a, a vulnerable to these like, um, re-identification of tags. So let's see if I'm actually, I haven't logged into this machine and like, oh, hooray, did it. Oh, blast. Always gotta be secure. And of course it doesn't wanna go. There we go. Yubi keys. 
can't so can't social engineer that. You'd have to hit me over the head with a mallet. Probably a pretty damn big one too. Okay, so this damn where'd it go? Let's share the screen again. Okay, so this is the Gretel console. So if you want to be able to synthesize a data set, you can literally just choose a file, upload it, and start synthesizing. I unfortunately do not have a data set here because, <laughs> again, I don't use this computer that much. But hopefully I, have, I don't have everything trained. Damn it. Um, I can do this in five minutes, right? Yeah, yeah, you can do this in five minutes, Mason. Pay no, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Uh, When we go to my collab notebooks, we go to demos. Nope. Let's go to workshops. Okay, so this is the code that we could use to, here, let me just run this, fine. Um, connect, train a synthetic data model, show you what you get. <laughs> So we're going to pip install Gretel Trainer. So Gretel Trainer is, again, it's our experimental platform. It's not really meant, like, you can use it. It's, all the features in here will eventually migrate them their way into the SDK as things happen. Um, here's hoping it wants to behave with me tonight. Sometimes I wonder what this thing does. Come on. Live demos are terrifying. Also, while we're waiting, let's see if anyone's added anything to the chat. Will I increase my font size? Yes, I can increase the font size. Uh, let me try real quick. If I there we go. Oh, pip! Anyone ever try to pip install over public Wi-Fi? Mm -hmm. There it goes. And that's what it always it says. I have to restart the runtime because it has like it eventually conflicts with itself. Okay, and then we just run it again, and it should be fine. Yeah, go right ahead. Uh, 125. 125M. Uh, it's GPT Neo. GPT 3 Neo 125. What's the damn thing? Is that it? Is that it? Okay. I, 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 like, I, yeah. Yeah. And we're still, we're like, so Gretel, so Gretel text, like text based synthetic data is like, like that model only got released a couple months ago. We're still definitely doing stuff with it. Like the LSTM, what? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll, I'll have to look into it. Okay, so now I have to get an API key. Nobody steal Mason's API key. Okay. Okay, so basically this is a US adult income 5K, 5K CSV. So let's go ahead and just download this and then open it up while it's training. So basically this is just like some weird, oh, Google Collab, we're so fun. Oh, yeah. Um, where's the plus, there it is. So this is basically just some giant spreadsheet with like basically like, work, like demographics, this is a demographics worksheet uh, sheet, sheet on like private, are they high school grad, married? What's their, what do they do? Blah, 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 race, gender, capital gain, capital loss, all this stuff. Very boring data set, very boring. No one talk, no one, no one wakes up in the morning and wants to train on this model, but it is an easy model to train on. So we've started training the model. Uh, it's going through, this will take a handful of minutes. We'll come here, refresh the page. And then let me just go here and let's download this and save this. Save page as. Will you save it as a CSV? Oh, it already exists. Fantastic. I don't even have to do that. So if we were doing this from, say, the dashboard, I basically just choose a file, go to downloads, US adult income 5K. It's going to upload it real quick. Am I lying? Upload. Mm, that's training. You're being mean to me. What's this choose a sample file button? I haven't seen this before. 
mm, synthetic healthcare. Nine, 10,000 records, 18 fields, approximate training time. We click next. I think we can just do that. Create a new project. Uh, Pi, Python, Austin user group. Creates a model. These are all of our configurations. So how many epochs, vocab size, learning rate, validation, num how many records to generate. So we can generate 5,000 uh, outliers, all, this, all of our documentation, and you would just generate it. And it would go through. You can modify all this. You can choose which, do you want to do natural language processing? Do you want to do time series data? Do you want to add high dimensionality? Uh, amplify, which is the statistical model. Tabular using a different model. So there's a lot of different options there. Unfortunately, I don't have time to run through them all. Man, that model is just chugging along anyway any other questions also if we if you have if you need to make any announcements for I, I will talk forever until you stop me so like yeah probably yeah i need about 30 minutes okay Q and a from <laughs> i will resume whenever the whenever it's done training but i think this is going to do 100 epochs and we're at 14 yeah. so if you have no other questions i have no other law i have no other answers for you Jacob has a question. Okay. Uh, please repost the question. I will scroll up, but am I supposed to drop into Gretel my data with PII and you will generate anonymized synthetic data for it? Yeah, yes, you can do that. I would recommend doing the transform and then the um the transform and then the uh synthesize for you. Will I increase my font size? I did, yes. Question. Will you share my demo? Uh, yes, I can um I can get you any of these uh Collab Google Cloud Notebooks. Actually, these aren't even that great. Go to the Gretel Blueprints repository that's in these slides, gretel.ai slash gretel-blueprints on GitHub. Just Google Gretel Blueprints. Um, there are way better examples there than there are demos that I have. My demos are very basic. Um, those are actually good. Do we run de-identification attacks on them, on the outputs to, on outputs to test them? I do not know, but we make very strong claims about it. So I would assume we do. I know we've done security audits and compliance on this stuff multiple times. So it would not surprise me if that happened there. Um, do you run, do, 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 question, do you, okay, I got this, sorry, I missed all those, Jacob asked them a lot. Um, I think that's everything. If there's anything that I missed, please just re-ask it, because it's, like, here. The video will be published so people can follow up. Yes, feel free. Uh, feel free to follow up, feel free to ping me, anything you want. If you just really want to watch a model train, we can sit. <laughs> I'm, I'm done. Y'all, please stop me before I keep going. <laughs> Do I have a version that works in your environment? Use Google Collab, it works in everybody's environment. Yeah. Yeah. I also have stickers. Come grab stickers. There you go. I'll put them right up here. And if anybody wants the forbidden digital ocean Python, Sammy, from 2022 when PyCon was canceled and I had 2,000 of these left in my house. <laughs> I used to work at DigitalOcean before I was here. So that's my, if you, if you use DigitalOcean, they have a mascot, it's a shark. People collect these. This is like the rarest one you can find. Because they only exist in my backpack. <laughs> Not saying it's gonna be worth anything, but who knows, maybe you can mint it as an <laughs> NFT. Haha, <laughs> bad jokes. Uh, uh, Florian, can you, can you put, uh, Jacob's asking if you can put them back on the speakers. Uh, I'm going to, I must, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think you're back on the speaker, Jacob. Can you hear me? Uh, you can hear us now. All right, you're back on the speaker in the room. Yeah. Yeah, we have about 15 minutes or so to clean up here. And then. But uh, yeah, I'll, uh, actually, let me uh, stop the uh, recordings. Okay. Wait, wait, wait. We didn't thank the speaker. You're on the speaker, Jacob. We should thank the speaker. Oh, yeah, we did. Yeah, thank you. We did, we did thank. Uh, 